journalist, producer, hip-hop historian. Elliot Wilson has documented the culture and led the conversation for over two decades. This is his blueprint. Who was the writer that first opened your eyes to the possibility of journalism, or music journalism specifically, as a career path for you? Well, I think it first started with sports, because my father wanted to be a professional baseball player. It was his dream. He didn't get to live it. He wanted it to be my dream. Um, but then, as I started to lose interest, I also looked at the business behind sports, and I kind of was attracted to the reporters, like Warner Wolf, who's this big personality on CBS. He'd be like, let's go to the videotape and uh, Howard Cosell and seeing his rapport with Muhammad Ali. So those, I think, were my first earliest media influences. I definitely saw the source when it was first becoming a national magazine, and that was like, wow, like this is a magazine that covers our culture, and this feels special, this feels urgent. You know, on the mission of wanting to be, to work for the source, I met guys who were doing their own independent magazine at a time, a newspaper in 92 called Beatdown. It was Haji Akiba Day and Sasha Jenkins. But you and Sasha had met in high school um, no, initially, No, no. The right? thing about Sasha Jenkins is that we had went to the same high school, but we actually met, I went to a Karis One show by myself. You know, I was definitely an awkward, shy kid. I didn't have a lot of friends. Pretty much probably had no friends. And I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna get on the train. I'm gonna go into the city. I want to go to this show. I love hip hop. Karis One, it sounds incredible. So I go to the show. I'm nervous, like walk in, so I go, I'll go to the bar to get a drink. And Sasha comes up to me and he's like, Yo, you look like you went to my high school. Da, da. I'm like, Oh, okay, Brian, you know, da, da, make small talk. And then I went downstairs and I met Haji and he was like, Yo, you go to my college and I haven't gone to LaGuardia Community College. So then they both had a connection to me or saw me around and they were telling me about Beatdown. They showed me it. Um, and I was like, this is cool, they had Cypress Hill on the cover, it was their first issue. Yeah, I called them the next day, and pretty much my pitch with them was like, I could be a music editor, you know, I, I love this music, I love this culture, and then that was the beginning of me sort of like really embracing, like, I'm just gonna start doing this thing. After about two years, the relationship with Haji falls apart between him and Sasha, his yeah. partner, and you sort of as Sasha's friend and, and the third wheel. It just came to a point where you know, it was uncomfortable and I was kind of like, you know, I was still cool with Haji, but at the end of the day, I started really connecting this with Sasha and seeing that there was more that we could do and more that we could create. And then we started thinking of the ideas of how you look at culture. And even though we're doing a hip hop zine at the time, it's not just about hip hop. We're going into the village and we see these kids listening to rock, hip hop, these worlds are combining graffiti. There's a thin line, it's like, and no one's covering that. Like, no one's covering what the world would become, that all these genres are, are correlating together. It's not just this box of hip hop. Sasha saw that and had great insight, and that's where the idea of Ego Trip began. During that period, you guys assembled really an all-star crew of creators yes. from internally, guys like Chairman Mao, Gabriel Alvarez, Brent Rollins, yeah. you know, as two 23-year-olds who are doing this scrappy independent magazine for essentially no money, how did you put <laughs> together this kind of team? It was all natural, but I think Sasha was always the nucleus. Sasha knew Mal. Mal was the key, uh, and I just, you know, he had an insane record collection. It was like he really just knew his shit about hip hop, and, and I learned about sampling. Like, I remember being over his house, and he was playing me uh, Quincy Jones' Summer in the City, and that was far side passing me by. And, and then Gabe and Brent came from us getting our first trip to go to another city to cover the culture, which was flying to LA to interview Cypress Hill. And, it just was organic. I think it was just, again, just this belief that our voices needed to be heard. Uh, we felt like the underdogs, like the sources and the vibes and all these things that came were more established and had more funding and were like big companies were behind them. And, you know, we felt that independent spirit. How did you come up with the name and the tagline? I think the arrogant voice of Musical Troop was from Sasha. Ego Trip came from me. It was really the De La record, the Ego Tripping uh, from the Balloon Mind State album. But at the end, it, it has sort of that case of Ego Trip, Ego Trip, Ego Trip. And that, like, I was just listening one day and it was just like, that's it, Ego Trip. Because you have to have some level of ego and put yourself out there. And then it's always that balancing act, right? You don't want to trip. You don't want to be, you don't want to lose yourself in, in all, the, all the attention and you want to keep the core of who you are as a person. So it just felt perfect from jump. We started plotting that out, like I guess summer 93, and then um, spring 94, we, we launched our first issue with Nas on the cover. After Ego Trip gets going in that first year, um, you guys are both able to sort of 
branch out and break into the mainstream media and, and you start writing for rap pages, you start writing for mm -hmm. Vibe. At Vibe, you make uh, a connection that would change your life forever. <laughs> Can you tell me about that? Me and Sasha were at uh, the Shark Bar. We're telling our jokes and just being silly and, and uh, this white dude, Rob Kenner, is taking a liking to us and he says he works at Vibe and we're like, yeah, sure you do, sure you work at Vibe. Like, and then um, he gave us a card, we hit him up, started doing a little stuff for him. But yeah, then we met Danielle. Danielle was uh, Danielle Smith, my wife, Danielle Smith Wilson, and she was the music editor. And she taught me how to really, structure-wise, how to really construct a record review and what the intro is and the transitions and what you're really trying to say. And like, you know, I was definitely a young writer that was about, you know, it just sucks, it's just not good. Like, why does it suck? Like, how do you get, how does your criticism become constructive, so? So at the end of 1996, your career takes a huge Only step forward. Only in 96? Yes. <laughs> uh, your career takes a huge step forward. Yes. When you are finally granted the job that you have been chasing, at this point now, almost five years, what is it like working at The Source during the peak <laughs> years? I was so serious about, like, calling all these labels and getting the music, and I had, like, a headset. I like the Janet Jackson headset, and I would just be calling publicists all day and just hunting artists down and getting records and I remember Irv Gotti telling me about DMX and be like, Elliot, this guy's gonna sell five million. And I'm like, well, maybe he'll go gold, maybe he'll go platinum. <laughs> he's like, he's Tupac, he's, you know, Irv, be, Irv being Irv. Irv was that as an A&R at Def Jam. So I would really sit and listen to everything all the time. I was the weird editor who kept his door closed, who was just constantly bumping hip hop music very loudly. You, you achieve basically what your dream job. You're the music mm -hmm. editor of the source. At 25. Yes. What do I do next? Well, <laughs> You, you, and, you, and you maintain that position for about a year and a half, almost two years, mm -hmm. and then you abruptly quit to no new job. What happened? Well, I knew I was in trouble because Corrupt had a song called Five Mics, and I got called into a meeting where Corrupt was playing this song, and Corrupt, I guess, had gotten really cool with Dave Mays uh, at the time, and it was like, Five Mics, dedicated to the source, and all that, and I get, put out his record. His record wasn't that great. I wanted to give it, a, I think, a three or a two and a half, and they changed the rating on me. And it was another record. I don't know if it was like a... Um, Tribe Called Quest. No, it wasn't Tribe. It, wasn't it was a thing? lesser... Okay. It was lesser things. It was a, uh, might have been Shaq, it might have been a Shaq album, something like that, but just the audacity that they would go back and change the, the ratings, unbeknownst to me. And I remember I, I got the copy and I'm all excited, I got the print back, I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is a mistake, it's not whatever it was, it's not three and a half, it's three. Like, what? it's two and a half, it's two, like, it's not, this isn't right. I just was upset and I, <laughs> I, I think I flipped and I was like, you know, you guys don't respect me. You know, Jerry Maguire did, and I just hopped out of there. Like, I was like, I'm not doing it. Wilson left his dream job and jumped forward as the editor of XXL. There, as an underdog, he punched above his weight class in a nasty grudge against his former employer. At the end of 99, you end up getting a call from uh, Harris Publications. Yes, Dennis uh, Page. Well, actually, I credit John Schechter. He developed a rapport with Dennis, and I think Dennis Page was speaking to him about, you know, XXL, I like this thing, but it's not doing great. Like, I feel like there's one more run here, but I don't know who to take over this, this product, take over this brand. And I think that uh, Schechter told him that Elliot Wilson probably could do it, blah, blah. And that was the first time people, I think, that didn't view me as I could be a boss. Again, I never was trying to be a boss. I always wanted to be number two. I wanted to be the music editor. I wanted to be the support system at these companies. And then when I met with Dennis, I felt like this is something I could do. Like, it's time for me to step out and see if I could do this thing. When you start at XXL, mm -hmm. your mission is to top the source. Yeah. What was the process? Not top them, destroy them, kill them, bury them, Noah. I want to burn to the ground. What, what was the process <laughs> and what was the, the sort of plan that you implemented in order to do that? I felt always from jump that if I put pressure on them, things would go my way. Like it was almost like a, a, a sports analogy of, of a of pressing defense. Like I had to be very aggressive towards them. And they would laugh at me at first and just think, you know, that guy's crazy or whatever. But then all of a sudden, slowly and slowly, I started building up an audience and started becoming more formidable. And I was just very aggressive in my approach, even behind the scenes. So let's say there's three artists out there. There's Mystical, Ja Rule, and another artist, and they have albums coming out. Instead of, you know, knowing that I can't get them over the source, I would pursue the one I thought was the most important and try to get them to do my cover first because why are you waiting for the source to pick if it's gonna be you and I? I'm gonna go for you. I'm ready to shoot you next week. 
Like, let's go. So I ended up being more of an aggressive approach and it started to work for me. Your editorial letters become kind of the talk of the town. And <laughs> the talk of the town. You, you develop uh, an alter ego and character, YN, and start rapping in your editorials <laughs> and uh, going after your competitors in a, in a very pointed way that I think people in the editorial space at least were yeah. totally unfamiliar with. How was YN born? <laughs> Why it was born out of frustration. Now, nah, um, it's yellow N word. I try not to say that word anymore. Anymore, my wife doesn't <laughs> like when I say that word, so I say yellow N word. Um, it was something I wrote in the editorial, just naturally. Like I think there was a lot of talk at that time that because of the ownership of Harris, it was less authentic than maybe some of these other brands that were had black African Americans in power positions. And I was like, I'm going to be editor in chief, and and my my. I'm black, I'm half black actually. My mom is Ecuadorian and Greek, my dad's black. But I never went through any uh, tragic mulatto thing. My dad said, you're black, and that's it. And I'm like, okay. And, <laughs> and I'm blessed to have these other ethnicities too. But I always view myself as a black man. I'm like, my magazine's not any less authentic. I'm a and where I'm a yellow N word, and it just took off. And then it ended up being that the boldness of that voice was con contained to that nickname, to that character. The relationship that you would develop with Eminem and 50 and the Interscope machine was <laughs> the machine. incredibly important for the yeah. success of XXL in the long term. But when you got to that job, that relationship didn't exist. Can you explain what, what the situation you stepped into was? Yeah, the XXL, the original editors over there had wrote an article criticizing the idea of Eminem. You know, the idea of a white MC being dominant, you know, we have been stung by this vanilla ice thing. So they wrote something very critical about Eminem and he didn't love it. Um, so he had a bad rapport with them. And then we ended up running this horrible illustration in the first issue I did with DMX and I'm not proud of. <laughs> like <laughs> Eminem's mom spanking him and it was an ugly ass illustration, it was terrible. And that's what he's referring to on Marshall Mathers. Like, he goes, you know, I walked in the newsstand, took the last page, and picture my big white ass, double XL, double XL. So, you know, that was great. Like, I got this in the very <laughs> first issue I ever did, but that wasn't helping the relationship. But what happened was, we were big supporters of 50 Cent. I had seen how he just was killing things on, on, a, on a street level, the mixtape level. Like, I remember walking by the office and everyone at the cubicle was playing 50, and I was like, this, this, guy's, the, he's, this guy's really controlling the underground and the streets. Like, we gotta cover him. So we would do everything with him. We would do small profiles of him. We'd do fashion. We'd try to find ways to just keep putting him in the magazine every month. And then he signs with um, Eminem. So it's like, well, how's this gonna work? Is this guy gonna say, I can't mess with y'all anymore because I'm over here and they don't mess with you? So that's where it began, where Paul reached out through you, because you, you sort of was a buffer of that setting up that meeting. So I was only going to the meeting with the idea of, okay, how do I convince him to let me get a 50 Cent cover? And he comes to me and says he wants to do 50 Cent, Eminem, and Dr. Dre. Obviously, I would have just took 50 Cent, but the idea to have this 50 Cent, Eminem, Dr. Dre cover was, was knew it was going to be a game changer. And you did the story, and, and obviously it lived up to the hype, and was was definitely that was the first time where we actually outsold the source, you know, per issue. Around the same time, um, the source publishes an illustration of a the Benzino. Damn illustrations S always get me in trouble, Noah. A, a Benzino S <laughs> character breaking what looks to be your back, usurping the throne. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. There was an incident, though, that happened in real life. Can you mm -hmm. tell me what happened? 50 Guests edited the 50th issue, ironically. So he came up with this idea of doing a, uh, a Benzino illustration that Benzino didn't like. So I finally gave Benzino an idea, uh, a reason to come up to the office. So he came up there, um, we got into an argument. He basically you know, asked me, yelled at me, and never really put hands on me. But obviously, it was there that it could have went there. He had his peoples with there, and my staff was there. And it was just this big face off. And it had just got to this ultimate like showdown. But thankfully no punches were thrown, uh, no, nothing really physical happened, but you know, I, I said, look, I'll, I'll chill, I'll chill. You know, we put ourselves in the beef, in a sense, and I don't, I, all those moves weren't the right moves, and it probably took Benzino coming up there for me to realize that, and then I had to scale back down and realize that I'm not trying to be the story, I'm trying to document the story. Um, when you think about that peak era of XXL, what are the covers that jump out to you, aside from MJ50, that, that really were the most impactful for the culture? Uh, I think the Wayne Birdman, shirts off, New Orleans, 
covering the Rockefeller breakup, which was the big story in 2005. We first did Damon Cameron, and then we did Jay-Z with the big all-star cover with LeBron and Kanye. And I was, I was leading the culture then, and like I could get what I wanted, where the other things were just dog-in, dog-out fights every month to try to get what we thought the best thing was. Now that you have sort of reached supremacy within the space, mm -hmm. um, you and your Ego Trip team also start exploring new ground, working in television. Yeah. You guys do the Race Rama show on VH1 and then the White Rapper show. Yep. Um, an amazing piece of <laughs> bizarre reality TV. How did the idea, research. How, did, how did that come together? It was the idea that Sasha just brainstormed. What if we took all these white rappers and put them in a house in the South Bronx and told them about the culture and we kind of said it drunken and half being silly and they liked the idea and we were off and running. And you know, now you look at it now, it's like, that looks weird, but back then there still was this stigma against white MCs. It was, it was a big deal to be a white rapper. Even though you had this silly premise, you know, we, it was a legitimate show. We had great guest stars and we really taught people a lot about culture. And that's always the fight we have now too, where it's like, we know this is this big pop phenomenon and we are the purveyors and our numbers back it up, but what do you really know about the culture? So that show comes out and is um, critically hailed and you know, at least a, a solid hit on the channel. Yes, sir. And it earns you guys another look. Yeah. The female rapper show. Yes. Which, in some ways, you guys went bigger and bolder, <laughs> um, but it was not received with the same uh, admiration and gusto. Yep. Where do you think it went awry? It just wasn't the right, I don't think it was the right idea. I think it was a, it was a force of trying to do something that was similar to what the white rapper one was. Um, and at that point, we also creatively, as, I think we're as friends, you know, friends being in business together is a heavy load. And I think we're starting to grow apart and other people's voices weren't being heard. We weren't as in communication together as we once was. And I think that was always part of it. But I'm still proud of it. I think, it, I think it's still quality, but it just didn't resonate the same way the previous thing had. After years of this dogged back and <laughs> forth with the source, you finally get to the top spot. Uh -huh. And within about two and a half years, things sort of come apart between yeah. you and Harris Publications mm -hmm. and Dennis Page, and you end up getting fired. What happened? The business had changed, and advertising was down for the first time. And I was due for another big increase, and I think they felt like, you know what, if we chop the big guy down, our bottom line, and I think they felt they could carry it forth with what we had built and not have to deal with me. You look at any situation, you have a star player, but eventually ownership and a star player can't always stay on the same page. And you start to become resentful and things grow apart where it's like, you know, are you, is this one individual bigger than the brand itself? And I think that's what we ended up facing, but ultimately ended up being the best thing for me. By the top of 2008, you've sort of achieved so many things and so much success and you become estranged from the Ego Trip guys. You end up becoming fired from XXL. Mm -hmm. What was that like emotionally? I felt like not being a double XL or not being with Ego Trip, like where, 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 where can people even contact me? Like where, what's my foundation? And it was just trying to figure out like how to build a new community and figure out what my next step was gonna be. But at the end of the day, I know it's a cycle of things. You are, have your good times with people and you have your bad times with people. You fall out, you reconnect. My challenge was, I always know that if I can stay hot, if I can stay relevant, if I can stay at the forefront, stay an important voice in this, it's gonna come back in my favor. Like, I'm gonna be here. You know, I'm not an artist, I'm gonna be here. I'm, I'm standing here in the circle, like I'm here. After being tossed from his perch at XXL, Wilson had to reinvent himself. By moving his personal brand to the forefront, he positioned himself as the voice of the culture. Right after XXL, Paul Rosenberg had reached out to me. You know, he looked at what was going on in the landscape and he said, you know, that my voice is missing in the culture. And he had the idea of us starting a website. And he felt like hip hop didn't have that singular voice. So that's kind of how the idea of Rap Radar came along. So, you know, even though I was going through things tough emotionally, the seed was planted that my next thing probably would be Rap Radar. So at that time, the, the blogosphere is really just starting to come to like full maturity. You have places like Not Right, Two Dope Boys, um, Hip Hop DX, all new sort music of, cartels. Yes, the new music cartel is <laughs> is really coalescing and becoming yeah, they were dominant. You know, when you're looking at the landscape, how are you feeling that you can be additive to it? I thought uh, again, with me and Beat Brian Miller, uh, we're journalists, you know, and I thought we take more of a journalism approach to it. 
just really even from the point of just getting up earlier in the day and getting posts up. You know, if they, if they don't post till 11, the first post is at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., we're going to have 12 posts up by 9 a.m. and like really approach it that day and sort of like make people realize that it's time for another brand, it's time for another voice. Because those, those sites were great and they were dominant. Um, but I felt like even the name Rap Radar made it feel like significant that this is something new, this is something fresh. During that period, you also sort of changed how you approached sort of carrying yourself within the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, at XXL, you stayed behind the, the iron gates of your office <laughs> and it was nearly impossible for anyone to get into contact with you. But once you started Rap Radar, all of a sudden we saw you out in the streets at events, taping things with your camera phone, you know, really press, pressing the flesh and interacting with artists and other people in the community in a totally different way. You know, did you think about that explicitly in your head? No, I think it was just a natural progression. I had started to see people doing things and I was attracted to it. The same way I had that spirit to go see KRS One live in 92. Um, and I think that I needed that. I needed that energy. I needed to like reconnect to this culture. At the end of last year, you decided to end working on Rap Radar after seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and you made the move to become uh, the director of content for Tidal. What prompted you to make that move? Looking at the landscape and looking at streaming, you know? Streaming is, you know, the way when people were talking about magazines and it shifted to the internet, you know, I made that transition. And I look at streaming and I look at what, what these, these companies are doing and how people, music is being consumed. And I was fascinated by it. And then when I saw that Tidal had gotten some input from uh, Sprint investing in it, I reached out to Jay and I was like, you know what, I want to go, I want to, I think that I could add to your company. I can bring content, I can create content, I, I have ideas, like, I, wa I want to do this. And I didn't know at the time that they were already planning on making some sort of major editorial changes and Angie Martinez was involved, and Tony Javino, who I have great respect for both of them, were involved. And I didn't know that was going on and I was like, this is great. I just jumped in and I love it. It's a challenge for me, you know, it's like probably the first time I haven't you know, been in a company where I'm the boss and there's not like my little private office. I'm in the mix with everybody. I'm working hard and it's, we're building a great team. And it's just, it's just it's startup energy, you know, it's, it's exciting. I think there was, and I think we're doing great work. I think we're consistently great creating really strong content that's connecting to the audience. What do you think the most important characteristics are for an editor in chief? Build a great team, obviously. Uh, recognize other people's strengths and talents. Uh, be accountable, be a good listener, be a decision maker. What I do oftentimes in my business thing is I, if I go to something new, I'll do everything myself at first and sort of set the template of how I want something and then I can pull, start to pull back more and more and give away authority and give away decisions and give away things and oversee it. But first I want to set the blueprint of what I think this is. Because I have to get my hands dirty myself to figure it out. And then once that happens, then I can slowly start to feel like I could pull back and then be open to other people's strengths and that they may say something that you don't know and give you the idea and they come with their perspective. You've been uh, a leader as an editor in chief, but you've also been part of a partnership in Ego Trip and you're now, um, you know, working with a team at Tidal. Yes, sir. You know, how do you think about those various roles within an organization and, and how you adapt yourself to it? I feel like I'm a great number one. I've, I've earned it, I've developed myself to become a great number one. I think at first I was a great number two, like I'm a great compliment. Like when Sasha came along, you know, from Jump, I felt like him and Haji were always arguing about who was to me a number one and number two in the, in the business. And I felt like when we started Ego Trip, I was like, no, you, Sasha, you're number one, I'm number two. You're, you know this business, you know what needs to be done. I'm learning from you. And I think that I, would, I love being a number two. I feel like even when I'm being part of a team, I'm still leading the culture space in hip hop, but I'm part of a bigger entity. So I can master my lane, but at the same time, I'm in service to the bigger goal, the bigger overall goal and connecting with others. And I think that motivates me and inspires me. Your, your interest in journalism and in this profession was never motivated by finances. However... Oh, it did, it did once I started making money. <laughs> once, once, once you got going, though, you became quite formidable as a negotiator. Um, what is the significance of money to you in, in your pursuits? 
Uh, well, I would do it for free, even to this day. This is something I love to do, so I, this is a dream job. Don't, to don't be. tell Jay-Z that. Exactly. <laughs> So that's the beauty of it, of, of trying to do what you would do for free and being paid as much as you can for that. Um, and just realizing what that value was. I mean, what I'm very proud of too, speaking of that, is that I negotiated all my own stuff. I sat with whoever and I, I, I went from building my salary from 18.5 all the way to high levels. It was always to me about, let's get that right so that we don't have to think about it. A lot of, you know, not only just music journalists, but people in general, um, they fall in love with the music, you know, in their teen life. And as they grow older, they sort of stay in that zone. And they are interested in basically the music that defined their, you know, say 13 to 23. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think has always impressed me about you is that you care today as much about the Lil Uzi Vert album <laughs> as much as you did about the first LL Cool J album in 85. Yeah. How do you find that passion for it still? I think it's discovery, you know, I think that's what we champion now, right? I want to hear something new and fresh. I want to hear something that inspires me, excites me. If a Uzi Vert can make a song, a, a, a tour life type of record, and I feel like, wow, this record's amazing. The way, first time I heard Rock the Bells by LL Cool J. I want Uzi Vert to deliver. I want people to be better. And I think that's the same kind of thing. To love this culture, to me, is to be deeply embedded in it and to analyze it and to push it and to not just act like it's all great. There's a lot of bad with it, but there's a lot more good too. It's just, it's just a fan part of me. I think that I, the music still just inspires me and I'm thankful for it.